Let's give attention to the reading of God's word. Micah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Hear now the word of God. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth, and the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces, all her wages shall be burned with fire, and all her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. For this I will lament and wail, I will go stripped and naked, I will make lamentation like the jackals, and mourning like the ostriches. For her wound is incurable, and it has come to Judah, it has reached the gate of my people to Jerusalem. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all in Bethlehem, opera. Roll yourselves in the dust. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shapir, in nakedness and shame, the inhabitants of Zanon. Do not come out. The lamentation of Beth Azel shall take away from you its standing place. For the inhabitants of Meroth wait anxiously for good, because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. The houses of Achzib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Merishah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy and inspired word. Let's bow together in a brief word of prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we are grateful for your love and for your kindness, and that as a father cares for his children, so you care for us abundantly and amazingly through the provision of your word and through Christ therein. We pray that you would feed us through Christ, that you would not only speak to us through your Son, but take his words and apply it to our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit, and in this way, that you would bring glory to your name. We pray and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I think we could say that perhaps the most famous divorce in all of world history uh, would be Henry VIII's divorce from Catherine of Aragon. Henry wanted a male heir, and Catherine could not produce one, and so she only gave birth to a daughter, to Mary, who eventually would be Queen Mary. Henry sought the approval of the Pope when he sought his divorce, but he was denied, and so he revolted against the Pope's authority, declared himself head of the Church of England, and then, of course, divorced his wife. I think no matter how many ways you look at his efforts uh, to divorce his wife, I think his actions were ultimately unjust. He looked for biblical, for legal, and even theological loopholes, any reason that he could to divorce her. And I suspect, essentially, that Henry's divorce replays itself in the courts throughout the world as spouses seek to break the bonds of marriage, as they look for any reason, any loophole, in any way that they can uh, to separate themselves uh, from their marriage and from their spouse. And so I think that naturally people have a worry that if you go into a court of law, especially in such a case, that there's going to be some sort of unfairness. Somebody is going to get mistreated. Somebody is going to suffer an injustice. 
And we can certainly say that Catherine of Aragon suffered injustice. And in fact, it was her daughter, Mary, who looked upon her mother's situation and looked upon it very unfondly because she saw that her mother was so poorly treated. But yet what we find here in the opening chapter of Micah is in many ways a divorce case. It is where God is divorcing his bride, Israel, because she has violated the terms of the marriage covenant. But I think we can say without a shadow of a doubt that Micah presents a divorce case that is really unlike any other that we have seen. And perhaps we might say that this divorce between the Lord and Israel is the most famous divorce case in all of history. Except unlike Henry VIII, where we can see sin, where we can see injustice, we can see him seeking theological, legal, and moral loopholes, there are no such loopholes here. And in fact, we find that what Micah serves is he serves as God's prosecuting attorney. And he calls Israel into the courtroom, and he puts Israel, if you will, in the bar and says, you are guilty of crimes, guilty of sin. And this is essentially where we find ourselves in this court of law as Micah prosecutes his case against the nation of Israel. But we want to recognize that Micah is going to prosecute this case with the utmost sake of, uh, for the utmost uh, degree of righteousness and holiness, and that in reality he brings an airtight case against Israel. You see, Micah was a prophet during the 8th century. He was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah, and he lived at this time in the southern kingdom of Judah. And we see here in verse 1, it says this, The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. We know that this is an airtight case because it says here in verse 1, The word of the Lord that came to him. This is not Micah simply delivering his own verdict. This is not Micah zealously prosecuting sinners on his own, but ultimately he receives the word of the Lord to bring his case against the people of Israel. And so what I want us to do is I want us first to look at Micah's charge, what he has to say about Israel's sins. And then secondly, I want us to look at Micah's lament, because I think unlike any other prosecutor, Micah not only prosecutes his case against the people of Israel, But he also laments the guilt that Israel has. He laments the judgment that is to fall upon Israel. But third and finally, we can say that without a doubt, this is definitely a dark passage of Scripture. There's sometimes I often fear preaching the prophets because they can be very dark portions of Scripture where there doesn't seem like there's much of a glimmer of hope. But yet even, believe it or not, in the midst of this dark chapter of judgment... I think we do see glimmers of hope, glimmers of salvation, glimmers of a Messiah who is yet to come, at least from Micah's standpoint. So we'll look at Micah's charge, Micah's lament, and then Micah's hope. So first of all, let's look at the charge. And that Micah's prophecy really opens up in a courtroom setting. Micah is the prosecuting attorney And he calls his expert witness to the stand. You know, perhaps you've seen a number of legal shows over the years where the courtroom is hushed and the prosecuting attorney calls the key witness. The courtroom doors swing open and the courtroom waits with eager anticipation, wondering who it is it's going to be. Who will testify? Who is going to have that testimony that will bring the evidence that is necessary to prosecute the criminal? And as the hushed courtroom awaits to see who Micah will call upon, he calls upon God himself. You see this in verse 2. Hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you. 
the Lord from his holy temple. God himself descends out of the heavenly holy of holies, but his presence isn't one of blessing, but it's a harbinger of judgment. And in fact, you can see this in verse 4, where his very presence, in a sense, is the presence of his white-hot wrath. Notice as it says there in verse 4, and the mountains will melt under him, and the valley will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. The Lord's presence in his holiness is so intense that his presence melts the mountains in his path. What is it that has drawn the presence of God? Well, like the sin of Adam and Eve, as he walked in the spirit of the day, as he entered into the garden to bring judgment upon Adam and Eve for their sin, it was Jacob and Judah's sin that drew God's attention. In the simplest of terms, we can say that what the people of Israel had done is they had broken the covenant. They had violated their marriage to Yahweh. Verse 5, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? Here in reference to the capital of the northern kingdom, this is after the split, after the northern kingdom had gone its way and the southern kingdom had gone its way. And so he says, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? Is it not your capital city? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? your capital city. Now, when Micah here speaks of transgression, I think it's not just simply an ordinary sin, but ultimately he's using terminology indicative of the violation of the covenant. Think, for example, of the covenant code in Exodus chapter 20 and recall that Israel as a nation had sworn a covenant oath when they stood at the foot of Mount Gerizim and at the foot of Mount Ebal as God promised them blessings for their obedience, but he also promised them judgment for their disobedience. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Israel had run up a bill of sin, and now God was coming to collect. And he was coming to bring his holy and just expert and witness testimony against Israel for their sins, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. For their idolatry that we see in verse 7, God would turn Samaria and Jerusalem into a heap of rubble. That Micah employs the all-knowing expert testimony of God to announce to the people that they will be destroyed. Verse 7, her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire. While we don't know exactly all of the reasons as to why God is bringing his judgment upon them, we know at least in this particular case, at this point in his prophecy, that they're guilty of idolatry. They have engaged in false worship. They have bowed down to idols. And for their idolatry, God is going to break their idols into pieces. Their worship was impure. Rather than dedicating themselves exclusively Uh, to their covenant uh, Lord in worship, the one true God. They bowed to graven images. They sold their birthright interest in the covenant promises of God for the pursuit of worldly goods, for food, for shelter, for clothing. And they sang praises uh, to false gods and forgot their one true God, their bridegroom. I think we can say that God's judgment was coming. And Micah was announcing it to both the northern and southern kingdoms. Now, what we have to recognize, I think, is that our temptation might be is to see this as history and history alone. I certainly want to say it is history. Micah did utter these words. The Israelites were guilty of the things that Micah charges them with. But, beloved in Christ, this is not merely history history. 
You see, ultimately, we have to recognize is that when we look at incidents of judgment, or in this particular case, prophecy of judgment, that what we're ultimately looking at is we're looking at a foreshadow of the final judgment to come at the end of all history. I think this is why here at the beginning of his prophecy in verse 2, he says, Hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. You see, the sin and the idolatry that played out at the regional theater of Israel would ultimately be played out on the cosmic stage at the final judgment. In other words, we can say that Israel's idolatry and the judgment that fell upon her is the judgment that plays out upon the grand stage of world history when Christ will return to judge all peoples for their idolatry. We hear these words, for example, in the book of Revelation in chapter 18, verses 2 and falling. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons and a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality and the kings of the earth have committed more immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. I don't think it's a mistake. I don't think it's by coincidence that the way that John describes the judgment that falls upon the world, he describes it in similar terms as what we find here in Micah in the first chapter. Babylon is guilty of idolatry. She's guilty of luxurious living. She's guilty essentially of spiritual prostitution. In other words, what's happening on the small stage of Israel will play out on the big stage at the end of history. And so thus we can say that Micah's chart is history, but it's also looking to the future. And this is why Micah calls all of the peoples of the earth, take a look, pay attention, see what has transpired here. Don't let it go by unnoticed. But this brings us to our second point, which is Micah's lament. You see, in a court of law, we might not expect the prosecutor to have much sympathy for the accused, especially a person guilty of a serious crime. You know, the the prosecutor stands on a perch of justice and therefore brings the full weight of the law against the accused. The greater the crime, I suspect the greater the sense of indignation. So we might say that Micah would have every reason to have a sense of holiness and righteousness and to say, how dare you? How dare you commit idolatry against the one true living God? How dare you scorn the blessings of God? How dare you worship false gods? And yet Micah laments the coming destruction. He strips himself bare and howls like a jackal. Verse 8, for this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals. I was so curious to this. I went to YouTube and I figured I could find it. Howling jackals. Found it. There was videos with sound. And it's an eerie sound. It sounds like wailing people, except people wailing with a deep, guttural pain. I think he cries and he wails because he has sympathy for the people. It's not that he condones their sin, but perhaps it's like a parent looking upon a child and when the parent laments the fact that he or she has to discipline the child. I think he weeps because of Israel's grave sin, like a father would weep over his son's apostasy. Why would you abandon the Lord? Why would you commit this great sin? 
I think like the Apostle Paul, as he arrived in Athens, looked out over the city and saw all of the idolatry, all of the idols, it grieved him to his core. And so I suspect that this is why Micah was lamenting. So Micah tells the people how they will mourn, too. There's a sense in which Micah's mourning, I think, is deep and personal. But it's also foreshadowing. He's telling them, this is how you will mourn. He says in verse 10, not to tell of the judgment in Gath, one of the capital cities of the Philistines, arch enemies of the Israelites. Don't let them know. They'll rejoice over the judgment against you. But rather in your own cities, in verse 10, they should roll themselves in the dust. Verse 11, they should walk about in nakedness and shame. Remember the shame of Adam and Eve when they sinned. They were naked and they were ashamed. They knew they had committed sin. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 48, Moses told the people, of the curses that would come upon them if they were disobedient to the Lord. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. Micah's laments, I think, were personal, but they were also illustrative. They were foretelling the kind of mourning that the people of Israel themselves would engage in because of the severity of the judgment. And he says in verse 12, they would wait and hope for some word of good news only to be crushed by the reality of God's judgment because, quote, disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. You see, Micah wants Israel to understand that they were going to experience God's judgment. This was God himself bringing about this penalty, this curse upon them. It wasn't by circumstance. It wasn't simply a natural disaster. It wasn't just un unfortuitous circumstances. He says there in verse 13 that not even the war horses and the chariots from the Solomonic chariot city of Lachish would be able to withstand God's judgment. In fact, I think basically what Micah here is saying is, is that, oh, Israel, you put all of your faith in your military might in your chariots, and in your war horses. But yet this too, according to verse 13, were among the transgressions of Israel. But here we see, I think, Micah's faithfulness. Because I suspect that he had to announce judgment, judgment that was severe. And notice there in verse 14 that judgment was to fall upon Moresheth Gath his own home city. Verse 1, Micah of Moresheth. Verse 14, Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. Parting gifts because they were going to be taken off and taken away into exile. I think Micah's lament here ends in the worst possible scenario from Israel for Israel, and that they would be exiled from the land. Both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Verse 16, make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. The unthinkable would happen as God would send his people away. He would cast them out of his presence their children would be taken away, which means there would be no hope. What Micah here is saying is that he's saying God was seemingly even laying an axe to the root of the tree of Jesse. How would it be possible if God was going to take them into exile? How would it be possible if he would sweep away their children for the Messiah to be born, if it seemed as if the line of the Messiah itself would be endangered because of Israel's sin. 
And indeed, the prophesied judgment did come to pass. In 721 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away by the Assyrians. And in 587 BC, the southern kingdom was captured by the Babylonians. But once again, as we look at the lament and even the judgment, we should recognize that we're looking at the shadowy images of how things will lie in the final state. How things will be upon the return of Christ. Because here we see shadowy images of the coming exile for sinners and idolaters who live wickedly. The book of Revelation tells us in chapter 18, verses 9 and 10, And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her, Babylon, will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in the fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. The weeping in the morning of Israel being taken into exile is but a shadowy image of the judgment that will fall upon those who refuse to believe in Christ, who engage in idolatry. They will weep and wail and mourn because of the judgment of God to fall upon them. Now at this point, were I to end the, the message, we might think, well, gee whiz, <laughs> this doesn't seem very encouraging. But there's a sense in which we always have to look down as straight away as we can at the judgment of God against sin. We have to understand the full brunt and weight of the law before we can begin to understand the amazing nature of the grace of God. And it's here that we can finally look at the end at Micah's hope. Now, we might not see much hope here because all we hear is judgment. All we hear is condemnation. And in fact, we might think there is no hope because Micah himself even says in verse 9, for her wound is incurable. Yet I think in the prophet's living parable, we find shadows, I believe, of his and our hope as we can look back upon Micah's prophecy from the vantage point of the New Testament. Micah stripped himself bare and wept for Israel. I think he did so because he was lamenting for himself and for his loss. He was mourning over Israel's wickedness. And I think he was grieving over the fact that Israel would suffer God's impending judgment. But yet I think in his stripped condition, I think we can see faint glimmers of the prophet of prophets, of Jesus Christ himself. It was Christ in his earthly ministry who lamented over Jerusalem and the impending judgment that soon was to fall upon her. In Luke 13, 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. It's powerful imagery that Christ invokes here. As he weeps over Jerusalem, he knew that the judgment was coming, and like Micah, he mourned over it. He uses this imagery of a hen protecting her brood from a barn fire, where the barn is ablaze, and in order to protect her brood, the hen will cover up her, her, her young chicks so that even though she would be consumed by the fire beneath her, her young chicks would be preserved from the heat of the fire and would live. So that they've uncovered barn fires and pulled aside dead chickens and find, found a brood of, of, of little baby chicks alive. And I think that is what... Christ is saying, he says, oh, how I would want to gather you beneath my wings to protect you and to keep you from the fiery wrath of God. But you were not willing. 
Beloved in Christ, Christ hung on the cross, stripped of his clothes, and he bore the curses of the covenant for us. For us. As Paul writes in Galatians 3.13 and following, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. See, Micah only lamented and walked around unclothed to grieve and foretell of the coming wrath. But Christ's mourning and nakedness actually redeems us from God's wrath. In our sin-fallen state, we lie like Israel, guilty and naked before the white throne of judgment. And yet, in his mercy, Christ extends his grace to us. He grants to us the gift of faith that we might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be saved, so that we can take shelter beneath his wings, and so that Christ himself bears the white, fiery, hot wrath of God on our behalf, so that we don't suffer the curse, but rather that we can enjoy the blessings of eternal life. He covers us with his wings. He clothes us in the beautiful garment of his righteousness, so that unlike The adulterous Israel, God's bride, we can be that spotless bride without blemish as Christ presents us before the throne of God. So, beloved, as we look upon Israel's idolatry and judgment, We have to heed Micah's call. Hear you peoples, all of you. Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. We should ask ourselves. Do we engage in idolatry and sin as Israel did of old? We may not realize it. But this morning, when we took of the Lord's Supper, it was a miniature anticipation of Christ's return and the final judgment. Because the Apostle Paul says that as Christ descends into our midst, we have to examine ourselves and ask, am I looking to Christ by faith? Am I trusting in him alone? Am I trusting in his broken body, his shed blood, to free me from the guilt of sin and to free me of my shame? And this is why Paul says, examine yourselves. Flee to Christ. Because if we engage in sin like Israel did, then I think all we will end up doing is potentially lamenting over our sin as Esau lamented his loss of the birthright and of the blessings of the covenant. How the book of Hebrews characterizes that is as a worldly lamenting. A lament merely of loss. Not a mourning over sin. But beloved, if we seek shelter in Christ, then we can rejoice and we can know that, yes, we may lament over our sin. We may regret the sins that we have committed. We may feel shame, but then we can know that we have freedom in Christ. The prophet of prophets who has borne the curse of the covenant for us so that we can have joy, so that we can have happiness, and so that we can say that as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. We can come into the presence of God in the words of that hymn, Rock of Ages. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. We need not clean ourselves in order to come to Christ. He cleans us. He purifies us. He redeems us.
But may we never use the grace of God in Christ as a cover-up for sin. May we always recognize that he who has saved us, he alone is worthy of our worship. He alone is worthy of our praise. May we look upon the judgment that has fallen upon Israel of old and may we recognize that Christ has delivered us from this judgment and rejoice. And in the end, let us give thanks to Christ, our faithful prophet, who has not only given us the words of life, but that he has indeed given us life itself. Let's pray and bow together in a word of prayer. Oh, Father God, we give thanks. Sometimes reading about judgment can be difficult because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a holy and righteous God. For who of us, apart from Christ, could stand in your presence were you to count our sins? And yet, O oh Lord, in your mercy and in your kindness and in your love, you have reached into the miry depths of our sin. You have pulled us out of those dark waters. And you have breathed life into us. You have raised us from death to life. You have cleansed us from our sins. You have clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. And now, O oh Lord, we stand in your presence with Christ, our bridegroom, as a spotless bride. What wonderful manner of love is this, that we should be so blessed. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins. We pray that you would forgive us for our complacency, that you would forgive us, O oh Lord, for our idolatry, for so often we can allow idols to seek, sink, sink into our lives, to go, unby, uh, go by unnoticed. Have mercy upon us, we pray. Open our eyes that we might clearly see our sin. May we meditate upon your law so that we know how it is that we should live. And in seeing our sin, O oh Lord, that you would enable us to repent but that you would also remove the guilt and shame, O Lord, and fill our hearts with joy and with peace, knowing that in Christ there is now no condemnation. We rejoice and we give thanks for all of these blessings. And we pray, O Lord, that even this week, we would be so overjoyed that we would desire to tell others of how we have been delivered from the wrath to come. We pray and ask all of these things in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen.